Welcome to the Holy Post. Data indicates that white supremacy is growing in popularity. And according to the FBI, hate crimes have spiked by 35% in recent years. Why can't America shake itself free from white supremacy? The president and founder of Public Religion Research Institute, Robert P. Jones, is back to discuss his new book about the real roots of white supremacy. Also this week, why are religious Republican primary candidates losing so badly to Donald Trump? Plus, Ryan Burge says despite 30 years of conservative political activism, liberals have clearly won the culture war. So why are so many evangelicals still determined to fight it? All of that, plus researchers find that robot preachers stink, and Phil is confused about professional cornhole players. A few other quick announcements before we jump into the show. We've got some more Holy Post content beyond just this episode this week. There's a new video featuring Caitlin and three experts who go deeper into her Bible and politics explainer video. I've written a new article at holypost.com, and exclusively for Holy Post Plus subscribers, there's a new episode of Getting Schooled where Caitlin explains the evangelical affinity for conspiracy theories. You can find all of this at holypost.com and become a Holy Post Plus subscriber to get full access to everything we're doing, plus ad-free episodes. All right, here is episode 580. Hey there, this is Phil. Welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I'm here with Christian Taylor. Hey there. Hi, Christian and Sky Jatani. Hey, everyone. Hi, Sky. Boy, I, I feel like I'm more excited than you guys are. I am really happy to be here. I haven't been here in a long time. I I even had a comment from somebody like, where have you been? And they thought I was, you know, doing some dancing on a stage at uh, the Republican convention or CPAC or something, (laughs) Really, which was not me. Let me make that clear. Uh, I I did go to Orange Beach with my dad. I've been taking care of my dad. And then uh, this weekend, I was super happy to be in Dubuque, Iowa, your home state, Phil. Yes. Uh, Yes. Yay, Iowa. Yay, Iowa. I have fallen in love with this little town. It's just incredibly adorable. Mm -hmm. And I won the um, Julian uh, Dubuque International Film Festival two years ago, and a veterans organization had me back to do a screening. They are the Tri-State Women Warriors, and they partnered with the American Legion 6 in this little town of Dubuque, Iowa, um, to share it with the community and other veterans. And I had never been around a female veterans organization, and they were young, mostly because, you know, women haven't been in the military like in full force for a long time. And so right. they were all like 40 and under-ish, 50, you know? Wow. So that was really pretty cool to see them kind of come together. Um, a lot of the old veterans organizations are beginning to die out because younger guys don't seem to be joining um, hmm. as much. Hmm. So my, anyway. grandmother was a, my grandmother was in the Army in World War II. I know she was. She yeah. was a nurse, right? Yeah, she was in Patton's Army. She was one of the first medical units at Omaha Beach. Yeah. Did She's they? Got quite, so she helped. Help liberate the the concentration camps and did she join crazy stuff. any kind of veterans organizations? Did they have them? For I don't nurses? know. Were they allowed to come to the VFW hall for pancake breakfasts? <laughs> they I are. No idea, women both. are allowed oh, to okay. do that, and they were members. Okay. It was just predominantly they are male, yeah. and they were ones after World War II, and they continued through Korea and Vietnam, but. Um, you know, the younger guys, there's just not that same need to be connected, I guess, or belong, you know, to different groups. And I think that is evident in our culture, right? I think that's kind of what's happening with nuns, you know, nobody really wants to be join, whether it's a church or, you know, a civic organization. Yeah, the bowling alone phenomenon. We just want to be in little online communities where we don't actually have to meet anyone. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's your just, kind of thing, Phil. Yeah, can... <laughs> just me and the people who play this version of this Star Wars game that came out in 1997. That's my tribe. Yeah, this exactly. group of gamers. I'll never see one in person, and that's the way I prefer it. Okay, time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian. 
Today's episode is sponsored by Sundays. This is Phil. I have a dog. You have a dog. We love our dogs and we gotta feed them something. Fresh food with human grade ingredients is a better way to treat our dogs than that old bag of whatever that stuff is. Sawdust and cow bones? I have no idea. But fresh pet food is expensive and inconvenient. And that's where Sundays comes in. No, not the day. The new dog food company that makes air dried dog food from a short list of human grade ingredients. It's healthy with beef, chicken, and digestive aid like pumpkin and ginger. It's convenient. Unlike other fresh dog foods, it's zero prep, zero mess, and zero stress. Sundays is shelf-stable and ships right to your door. And it's affordable, costing 40% less than other healthy dog food brands because they don't waste money shipping frozen packages. We've got a special offer for our dog-loving holy posters. Get 35% off your first order of Sundays. Go to sundaysfordogs.com slash holypost or use the code holypost at checkout. That's Sunday sundaysfordogs.com forward slash holy post. Upgrade your pup to Sundays and feel good about the food you feed your dog. And thanks to Sundays for sponsoring this episode. Okay, I have a new idea for... Hang on, Sky's not with us. Sky, I'm here. where'd you go, dude? <laughs> I, was reaching, I was reaching for a notepad. Is your dog in the room? No, no, no. Okay. Is, it, is, is John crawling around on the floor behind your desk looking for something? No, so as far as I can tell, there's no one else no in, one is in your room. No one is in your room. For those of you that yeah. are listening, John is someone that works at the Holy yeah, Post. John's so. Holy Post CEO. He's yeah. he's the king of the Holy Post. Um, okay, okay. I have a new idea for a story um, based on a story that I found that I had this response to. It's a feel-good story that is at the same time confusing to me. Okay. <laughs> this should be good. We like good news, right? We like yes. good news. It can't all be bad news, right? No. We don't need all bad news, especially going into an election year. We do not need That's all bad why news. we started News of the Good. But oh you I thought you were gonna say news of the butt. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's why we started News of the Good. But this is this is feel good news that is yet confusing. Okay, here's this week's story. And this is a, a first person story. It's an inspirational story written by a guy named Dayton Weber, who is 25 years old. Okay, he says, What it's like to be a professional cornhole player with no hands and no legs. Wow. Okay, okay. Dayton Weber, hang on, hang on, Sky, hang on. Dayton Weber is a professional cornhole player in the American Cornhole League. Since he was 10 months old, he has also been a quadruple amputee. Now, when I first read this story, my first thought was, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are professional cornhole players? <laughs> <laughs> I kind of got Yeah, I've seen that I before. Kind of got stuck right there. Did you both know that there are professional cornhole players? I have seen cornhole that looked professional on TV at like sports bars if i would have thought about it for two seconds if you had asked me randomly i would have been like of course there are because there's professional everything how do you now. that's right how do you just like take a backyard game and just say we're gonna be professionals now because then you need sponsors so how do you yeah sponsor I, I will tell you i will tell you how it happens because this happened to me when i took my son to do bmx racing and i went to this Thing where he was going to go and race and it was this big gigantic building and I walked in and there were just thousands of people in here and over time I learned that it was this giant community of people that were obsessed with this thing yeah. that I never knew anything about and so what happens is like you have this one community of people that absolutely is so passionate about something have you ever heard of the people that collect lottery cards and do not scratch them off and they just hold on to these lottery cards and they have now dubbed themselves as lotologists and they get together in every year in conventions and it's people that just buy lottery cards and hang on to them don't even scratch them okay so okay 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 it okay. is possible <laughs> okay. there is a words, huge there's a community gigantic, for everything there's okay, a community on, for everything we just lamented that there are no more people in communities and now we've changed our, our song to say, actually... You have to be obsessed with something. You actually, have to be obsessed with something. there's a community for every obsession. So yes. we just, we're highly specific. I only yes. hang out with quilters. I only hang out with cornholers that are at mm -hmm. the elite level. Any, anywho, back to Dayton Weber. Dayton Weber, 
Um, when he was just born, he was uh, under one. He had a um, he contracted a serious streptococcus pneumonia blood infection when he was 10 months old. As doctors rushed to save his life, they realized they needed to amputate his arms and legs to slow the infection. Oh, wow. So that's a bummer. Um, but he has now become an elite level cornhole player. I, he says, I've been a professional for the past two years. While being a professional athlete takes up much of my time, I also create content for my YouTube channel and hope to begin taking on motivational speaking engagements. To train for cornhole, I play three or four hours a day. Much like, can you imagine <laughs> playing cornhole three or four hours a day? No. Like, la- yeah. like lawn darts? Three no. or four hours a day? No. Okay, I, I, Phil, Especially, I'm, I'm assuming he's. The... I'm assuming he's using his mouth, and so that has got. I mean, nope, does he use nope, his mouth nope, throwing nope, both nope, ways? No, no, no. I stand out because I do not wear my prosthetic legs during competition. Generally, I don't use prosthetic arms because they don't allow me to feel things, such as uh, this is the cornhole beanbag with enough enough sensitivity. So he uses his what he has of his arms. But he has no legs, so he's on the ground throwing with his arms, what the parts, upper parts of his arms. And Uh, he's an elite level beanbag thrower. I want to see this. Like, were his arms amputated above or below the elbow? Um, I'm looking at a picture of him as a little kid, and it looks like right about, it looks above the elbow just barely. That's amazing. It is amazing. That is amazing. See, this is a feel-good yet confusing story. Yeah, well, agree? well advertised. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> but I, I really want to see this now. Well, all you have to do is Google. Well, I'm well, sure. I know. I'm going to Google his this. His name is um, Dayton Weber in the American Cornhole League. How old is he now? Cornhole How old League. is he now? He's 20, he was 25, 25 when he, wrote he this said. Okay. in July. And, okay, another question. I'm just assuming that yeah. in Cornhole, there's no like... Like he competes with everyone else. Yes. There's no special league no. for people that. Oh no, no. Have he's got to go against the big boys. Limbs. He's got to go right, against. Yeah. Who would be in your? What would be a good name for the national champion cornhole player? The cornholio. What? No, like his actual name. You know, like you might make bull oh. riders. You'd say, oh, that sounds like a bull rider name, or you know, tennis players. Yeah, that sounds kind of you know, white shorts and upper class. I can't wait to hear it. What is it, Phil? Oh, I'm asking you. To, to guess what to, to guess i don't know what it is just, just oh that's that i thought there was going to be a championship no, no, no. name a champion's no, no, name no, no, that no, would no. fit okay. no what Whatever. would sound like a cornhole player name john boy yeah yeah it's okay. it feels rural to me it feels rural but well, it has corn in it. It has corn in it. It's, it's hard to set up a cornhole. cornhole. Yeah, it's hard to set up a cornhole game in your apartment building in the middle of the town. We've you... had multiple cornhole setups right outside the office here in downtown Wheaton. Well, okay. That's true. All right. Well, yes. Mm-hmm. All right. I Okay. It's very uh, upper class, sophisticated. It's people sipping bourbon and throwing cornhole bags. Well, I just want to say congratulations to Dayton. I think that he yeah. he's done an amazing thing. Also, congratulations to you for highlighting his story. Thank I'm happy you. to know about this. I so. feel good. And I'm a little confused. Not about <laughs> Dayton, but about the fact that there are professional cornhole players. Yeah. That well, if the, I guarantee you me. there are advertisers. And when there are advertisers, there's money. And as yeah. soon as there's money, you can be professional. Hey, if, if there's any chance that Dayton is a Holy Post fan, maybe we could uh, be one of his sponsors. Oh, yeah. Now you're talking and about could... giving money away. You know I know, what? I know. But I just, I, it's, it is an inspiring story. Yeah. I think it would be really cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure he has no problem getting sponsors because yeah. uh, he must he get a lot of attention. Out. He stands out. Okay. Right. Um, this is from the Department of Obvious. Well, that's sort of obvious news. But it pertains to stories we've had in the recent past. So it's a good follow-up story. We've talked about AI and AI sermons and are robots going to be doing, you know, preaching and pastoring? Study discovers that robotic preachers reduce interest in religious faith. Shocking. They are, the conclusion, they are certainly not the answer to declining attendance and involvement that some had hoped they would be. I have no idea who. Who hoped that? Uh, some. Some, Sky. <laughs> no one. Some hoped that. Um, this was a study done by, there's, a, there's a, a, an android named Mindar who practices in the Buddhist tradition. There's a robot. Wait, 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 wait. 
How can an android yeah. practice a religion? Yeah. The robot Pepper performs funeral rites, and there are proposals for robot Catholic priests. And there's an AI Jesus out there. So people asked, Is this, does this work? So, so people studied it. You'd say, we should study that. Wouldn't you say that? Because we could never guess for, with any accuracy whether robotic pastors and priests would attract people and pastor them well. If, if robotic people are bad, why would robotic robots be better? <laughs> robotic robots? Yeah, like pastors, people don't want mean. a quote-unquote robotic pastor. Yeah, they don't want right. a robotic preacher. So why would they want yeah. a robot preacher or pastor? Joshua Conrad Jackson, a behavioral science professor at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business, that seems like where you would study religion, studied the impact of robots and AI on religious adherence. They published a, their paper in the Journal of Experimental Psychology, and they said, you know what? Guess what? Whoop! Headline, the skeptics are right. Using a natural experiment in a recently automated Buddhist temple, study number one, and a fully randomized experiment in a Taoist temple, study number two, we consistently show that religious adherents perceive robot preachers. Now, this is the shocker. This is the shocking headline. Religious adherents perceive robot preachers and the institutions which employ them as less credible than human preachers. You're a robot. I find you less credible as a preacher. Yeah, this is this is like Captain Obvious stuff. Somebody people people go to religion for community connection and for a sense of connection to whatever you want to call it, the transcendent, the divine, depending on what tradition you're a part of. Yeah. It's all about relational connection, horizontal and vertical. And the moment you bring an AI or a robot or some kind of other artificial intelligence into that you are breaking the relational connection, which is the whole point of religion. So, yep. duh. Study number well, and three. You know what? Hang on. One more fascinating piece of data. Study number three replicates this finding in an online experiment and suggests that religious elites, in other words, leaders, require perceived minds. <laughs> <laughs> just perceived yeah, minds, not yeah. real ones. You just yeah. you have to at least create the impression of having a mind for me to, I don't to know. look at you as a religious leader. I have met some religious leaders who will be unnamed that I have seriously are, questioned whether they actually have a mind. Christian television does pr um, provide a counterpoint to this conclusion. But uh, Christian, you were going to say? Well, I just started thinking about something. You know, one of the things that makes pastors... Uh, I, I think important and other Christians, you know, in a Christian community is the fact that the Holy Spirit can be present in each individual and in a community gathering, you know, Christ left so that he could send his spirit to be with us. And so when he inhabits, you know, us people, we feel the spirit moving among us. Well, can he inhabit AI? Now that is the question. No, it's not a question. <laughs> okay, tell me why, Sky. <laughs> because I mean, AI if he not... wanted to take over the AI, he certainly could. Okay, well, first of all, just on a theological level, God is spirit. And as Paul says, we live and move and have our being within him. Like he is omnipresent. Yep. But that's different than saying the Holy Spirit inhabits a person or the Holy Spirit inhabits a temple or whatever. That is... That's a manifestation of God's presence in a particular way, in a particular person. God's Spirit inhabits people because we are created in the image of God. We are made to be representatives and vessels of God's presence. That is not true of a cabbage. It's not true of a kitten, and it's not true of a robot. So it's just <laughs> not... I mean, Scripture also says everything that draws breath draws its breath from God. So all living things in some way are inhabited by God's power, but that's not true of an AI or a robot or a machine. So thank you for clearing th that up. I feel like you yeah. feel like you have to convince me of that. <laughs> if if the Holy Spirit took over an AI, it would no longer be an AI. It would that's now good be point. just God communicating directly to us. Which would be pretty cool. It would. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, last week, we had the first GOP debate. I'm sure everyone had it on their calendars and, you know, popped popcorn to see what was going to happen. Of course, Donald Trump wasn't there. It was all the 
the uh, other guys and girl. The other guys and the girl. Um, Haley. What's her name? Haley. Nikki, Nikki Haley. Haley. Nikki Haley. Right. So, who my so father is, said won the debate. In case you were wondering, really? Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. So here's what's interesting. Here's here's what I found is interesting, and I wanted to get your impression of this. The conclusion of the GOP debate was that everyone is focusing on this Hindu guy, this Hindu rich guy, because he's on the rise. Rama Smarmy. Yes. The, the the Hindu rich guy is on the rise. Okay. The popular governor who declared war on woke is floundering. And the former VP who talks about the good Lord and the good book every other sentence is floundering, getting no traction whatsoever. But, okay, Hindu guy doing well, uh, a very effective anti-woke warrior doing poorly, a strong evangelical Christian who quotes the Bible all the time doing poorly, but none of it matters because the guy who's been found guilty of sexual assault and might be headed to jail for other crimes has got the whole thing wrapped up. Am I, am mm -hmm. I, am I getting this? You summed this? it up well. Yes, you're good with your summations today. What does that mean? What haven't we wanted? Good Christians. I don't even know why I'm going here again. But at least I know, okay, <laughs> when it's just down, I get it. It's just down to Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. And you say, well, I can't vote for Hillary Clinton. I got to vote for Donald Trump. But you're in the primary now. You got, you got Tim Scott talking about his Christian faith. You've got Mike Pence quoting from the good book and, and for his commitment to uh, abortion um, uh, uh, prohibition. So you've got people using the Bible people with actual governing experience using the Bible. But then you've got this, this billionaire who just says, hey, I don't believe in climate change either. And like, hey, he's fun. But of course, you're all a sideshow. We're waiting for the guy to hopefully not go to prison so we can vote for him. What is going well, on? I'll tell you what's going on. 60, I think it's 60 percent. Maybe it's even higher, depending on which poll you look at. 60% of Republican primary voters believe that Donald Trump won the 2020 election. So if you're one of those voters and you voted for Trump in 2016 and you think he was a great president for four years and you think he won in 2020 but was robbed of that victory, why would you consider anyone else? It, it just makes perfect so, sense. Okay. and. And and that's why Ramasmarmi, as I call him, is doing so well. It's because he's the one who defends Trump most, yeah. you know, voraciously, and is is the one who spouts things like yeah, Trump. Yeah, but he doesn't most. he doesn't make any sense because he say, in one on one breath he says uh, Donald Trump was the best president of the 21st century, and then the other breath he says, and I'm running against him. He's not running against him. He's running to be his VP. Uh, okay. That's what he's running I'm for. I'm just confused. But I'm confused. I, like, I think it, 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 part of it makes perfect sense when you look at the polling. If you really believe Donald Trump won in 2020, why would you go for anyone else? Well, because well, whatever happened, apparently the other side, if he did win, the other side knows how to make him lose even when he wins. So do you want to just try that yeah, again? Yeah, but... You think he's rightfully the president. You okay. think that the country is going to right this wrong. Here's another factor is when you look at um, Ryan Burge came out recently with data about what different religious groups, what news organizations, most different religious groups engage. And basically everybody except white evangelicals take in a whole variety of different news outlets. But white evangelicals and obviously Republicans are almost exclusively locked into Fox News. And if you watch Fox News a lot, you would think that that President Biden is a completely senile, inept, ridiculous figurehead of a president that a bunch of other people are using as a puppet. And there's no possible way he could win again in 2024 against Donald Trump. So you put all that together, your perception of, of Biden is in no way he can win, combined with the fact that you think Trump did win in 2020. And it makes sense that you would renominate this guy because you think it's inevitable he must win. Christian? No, that's exactly what I was going to say. They do feel like in a head-to-head -head match, and numbers show this. It's very, very close. In a head-to-head -head match, then tr they believe Trump will beat Biden and it will be their vindication. And truthfully, right. I'm sure they're sitting there going, there's no way he's going to jail. And, you know, 
And it's not even going to be over before he becomes president and he'll pardon himself and everybody else in there. So we don't have to worry about any of this craziness. It's just going to help us, you know, in the end. So it is a cult of personality that we're talking about. And so it's and and it's a a cult mindset uh, with everything around it. So there is no logic. You know, we're sitting here trying to make you know, sense of something that is beyond reasonable, reasonable sense, particularly when you're talking about Christians and Republicans, you know, you go back 15 years, you know, there are three people on that debate stage that people would be behind and it would be a much more divided race because of that, because they are Christians and they're talking about their faith. And it would be a very, very different story. They would, they're also talking about issues, regular issues. You know, Trump doesn't even talk about issues anymore it's not a mandate on any issue it's all on who he is christian i I agree with everything you said except one thing you said it it? doesn't make any sense i think it i think given the facts that the polls say these voters believe and have been told i think their actions do make sense their actions make sense but what they why they believe what they believe it is a psychological thing. Well, that's that... the thing. They they exist. Many of the and all of us have fallen into these traps. But they exist in an information ecosystem that is completely enclosed. And based on the data within that ecosystem, their decisions make sense. But even, it makes even, sense to renominate Trump. Even Fox News has yes. been criticized by Trump because they've sidled up to DeSantis. You know, because Rupert Murdoch decided he would prefer DeSantis. To Trump, so they've been running more pro DeSantis stuff, but nobody cares. Nobody cares because they just want more Trump. So I'm just struggling with the, you know, we held our nose and we voted for Trump to, hey, there's a bunch of other options. And this one quotes the Bible every time he opens his mouth. And he was part of this. He was They're part of the same him. administration that did all the things but, that yeah, you like. But he turned against Donald Trump. They are not yeah, happy but, with him. Again, if you believe he won in 2020, then how can you possibly support mm. Pence? Mm. The, and, and even when you look at DeSantis on Fox News, DeSantis will not come out strongly against Trump. He is even saying in veiled language, yeah, Biden's the president, but Trump really won. And so if no one's willing to criticize the reality that the voter base in the Republican Party is believing, why would you expect them to, for any reason to leave Trump? No one is telling them the truth, including people running against Trump, except for Asa Hutchinson and Chris Christie. Oh, man. And they're, you know, like 1%. Yeah, yeah. So it's just it's just inevitable. It's just inevitable. It's going to be Trump it and is. Biden again. And then here we go again. And every, yeah, we're, but the we're problem is... We're keep doing this until both of them die. Yeah, but unlike in 2020, there are some third party candidates that are running in 24 that yeah. risk taking votes away from Biden the way that they did with Clinton in 16, which could tip this in Trump's favor. Okay. I, I think we're on that train and we're destined for that. I, maybe I'm just a doom and gloom person, but oh, that is doom and gloom. You're can you imagine what that me. reality is going to be like? Okay. Okay. I, it, I, it's just last thing. Yes. It is really disheartening that in a country of 350 million people, our options are Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Like our Mm -hmm. system is broken and these two candidates do not reflect the depth, brilliance or ingenuity of this country. And that's tragic. Mm -hmm. They they do. Well, I'm not sure what Biden reflects other than just a a steady hand of the tiller that's been there uh, before and done uh, it before. I don't know. Trump, I think, just reflects anger and a desire to be entertained. Are you? It's like it's like a gladiator. He's our gladiator. He's gonna go get them. He's gonna go get them, and we don't even know what that means, but we like it. I'm confused. Okay, Ryan Burge put out something. Um, on his Substack, he says, liberals have won the culture war. He goes back to 1992 and Pat Buchanan's speech at the Republican National Convention. Pat Buchanan ran against George Bush in 1992 um, on the, Demo- or the Republican Party platform in the primary, did not win, but 
placed surprisingly highly, so he was invited to give a speech at the Republican National Convention. He gave a speech talking about what a terrible world it would be if Bill Clinton and his wife Hillary win in 1992, which, by the way, they did. Um, that we would have abortion on demand, we would have rights for homosexuals, we would have women fighting in combat units, we would have discrimination against religious schools, went on and on and on. The speech uh, was dubbed very soon after that, the culture war speech, the call to arms for evangelicals. His, his uh, closing, his conclusion was, my friends, we must take back our cities, take back our culture, take back our country. So I know that didn't start then, but it really hit a fevered pitch with the Pat Buchanan run for presidency and that, uh, that speech. Now, what Ryan Burge does and say, okay, well, let's look at kind of the issues that uh, we decided we needed to take back, that we needed to win on, and things like he came up with a list of five things that he could pull out of um, uh, re readily available data. He asked questions like, what's your opinion about a married person having sexual relationships, uh, sexual relations with someone other than their marriage partner? Is it always wrong? Almost always wrong, wrong only sometimes, or never wrong? Uh, the second question was, tell me whether or not you think it should be possible for a pregnant woman to obtain a legal abortion if the woman wants it for any reason. The third question was, homosexual couples should have the right to marry one another. Fourth question was, um, should pornography be illegal always, no matter what age, or just age restricted? And then finally, uh, should marijuana be made legal or not? And on every one of those issues... Uh, the, the country is more liberal today than it was in 1992 or even 2002. Every one of those issues we've gone to the left on as a culture. So is he saying that we should have elected Pat Buchanan and we could have avoided all of this? <laughs> uh, he, uh, I don't think he's saying anything. He's a data guy. He's, right. he's a data guy. So my, my question is, what do we learn from all of this you know did the, did the culture war fail or do we just have to do it harder do we just have to do it more is there a, what are we even trying to do anymore because this brings up christian nationalism and because all of these talking points are the talking points of christian nationalism is not it now it's gotten so bad that we really need to in some way impinge upon people's democratic representation you know, you need to be a Christian to vote or you need to be over 25 to vote because young people vote yeah. left too much. The irony is when you really dig into the data, and he talks about this later in his report, even among evangelical Christians, the younger demographic of evangelical Christians are super progressive on all these issues as well. So even if you had some kind of Christian nationalist right, that's what magic wand to say only Christians can vote— in the next 10 or 20 years, the country would be as progressive and liberal as it is now because even white evangelical Christians are super progressive on this stuff if they're under the age of 40. Okay, so what happened? How did liberals accomplish this when there was so much money being poured into conservative causes and conservative institutions. And what do you do if you're James Dobson and you're still alive and you're looking back over your 50 years of work to keep everything that's happened from happening? What? Christian, you were around. You and I were around <laughs> when Pat Buchanan gave that talk. Sky wasn't born yet. Hey, I was in high school. I was you around. You weren't born was... yet. Uh, yeah, I, I was in high school. You, no, you weren't born yet. Trust me, you were not mm. born. We knew, you knew half of those guys. I think B Pat Buchanan babysat for you when you were a little girl, didn't he? Could have been, could have been, yeah. What's, what's your impression? I think that the culture is shaping our religion as opposed to our faith and religion shaping our beliefs. Okay. Okay, well, but a lot of these issues aren't like should marijuana be legal? Isn't yeah, in the but that that is a cultural thing. The Bible yeah, don't it, say nothing about that. Well, what I'm saying is our you know the kids that have grown up, let's say they're forty and under, their culture has shaped them. You know they've grown up in a this culture where marijuana is not so bad, particularly when you you know, or given lots of other things. And now there's science to define, you know, 
it's where it kind of fits in that spectrum of mind altering drugs. I just think, you know, kids are no longer plugged in as much as they were in church. I think there is a, you know, backlash to what's happening in religion. And I think over time, you know, over time, our culture is changing and we're becoming less religious and that's what we're seeing. Okay. I, I think, I mean, I agree, but I think it's more complicated than that. Um, you know, the, there's a, been an illusion or delusion for a long time that church, religion, faith is driving people's moral decisions and identity and stuff. And it's rarely ever been that way, at least in, certainly not in our lifetimes. But then the alternative is people say, well, it's the culture. The culture is what's driving it. Yeah, but I think it's even more complicated than that. So I've been on this soapbox before, but it's economics. Mm -hmm. Economics drives culture. Culture drives religion or politics. You know, we keep, in white evangelicalism, we either think religion drives everything or politics drives everything. And both of them are way downstream from the culture and the culture is downstream from economics. So let me make my case here. In a consumer society, the core idea is that you need to empower the individual more and more and more to build their identity around their consumer choices, around the things they buy, around the experiences they consume. And in order to do that, you need to convince people that the essence of life is the fulfillment of their personal desires. Personal desires become sacrosanct in a consumer economy. Once you've built that into the, into the person's psyche, then personal desire is going to come up against all kinds of traditional values, like marriage. If I don't want to be married anymore, if my personal desire is to have a sexual relationship with someone else, I should be free to do that. In comes no-fault divorce. In comes the survey data you just cited, where more and more people think that extramarital sex is not a problem. If individual desire is sacrosanct, then gay marriage is fine, because the definition of marriage is no, not given to us by some outside authority. It's whatever two individuals decide it is, whatever their desire is. If my desire is to smoke marijuana, well, the federal government should get out of the way and not make that illegal. I should be free to do that. And so all of this is driven by the assumption that my life is built around the fulfillment of my desires and the economic engines of our society are dependent on that and the laws and mores and values are going to flow from that. And when religion gets in the way by saying you can't do this or you shouldn't do that, even that will adapt and be pushed aside. So this was an inevitable march based on a consumer capitalist society. And I don't think there's anything that Pat Buchanan could have done to slow this down or change it. And Okay. Okay. So, yeah. so... Well, can yeah, I just ahead, ask Christian. one question? So, I mean, I will say, though, when I was growing up and a lot of people that I know, because we're doing a lot of deconstructing right now, our faith, our upbringing, our church attendance, our community um, did influence what we believed. You know, I there were lots of things that I did or didn't do as I was growing up based on my faith. But I see that changing with the younger generations and it not being as influential in their, their faith or going to church or their church community or youth group, not being as, you know, as much a center in their life or forming their lives or their way of thinking. I mean, is that, yeah, do you disagree my, with that? My, my behavior as a kid was heavily shaped by my church community. Yeah. And, and I had a hard too. time imagining just going completely against what my community believed in. Uh, my, a generation later, my kids just have less influence from a church community. Right. You know, they're more influenced mm -hmm. by other communities, and now it's shifting that they're more influenced by online communities than right. by in-person communities. The question, the question to ask, though, is your church communities growing up, who or what influenced their values? Yeah. And you could say, well, the Bible. Yeah, sure. That but was even it. there... That was it. That was it. It was just the Bible. But... Part of consumer capitalism's invariable march is more and more atomization. Yeah. Where, I mean, we probably all grew up at a time where the thought was, well, your family should be the most important thing mm -hmm. that shapes who you are and what you're... Go back a few generations before that, and it wasn't just your family. It was your whole community, right? The, the, the group to which you belong. And so we've gone from a community-based formation to a nuclear family-based yeah. formation, and now we're increasingly just individual. And that's what capitalism requires you to do if you're going to have individuals who are who, 
who believe right. that their satisfaction comes from the consumption of and the of the products and experiences. The ultimate expression of the me of our current culture yeah. is that we like, all we all have phones that have cameras that point at us. That's right. Exactly. Not well, I, the I think world. And that, that goes to the heart of our sin nature, right? I yeah. mean, truthfully, we are our own God. We are by, you know, our sin nature. We're all about us. Okay. And so now we're just in an environment where our selfishness has dominated everything. Yeah. But you also have to uh, take into account that, you know, not everything conservatives held up was good and not everything that mm -hmm. liberals were pushing towards was bad. And the most obvious example is race, uh, you know, race and gender where. And so now we see you know, a big backlash from the right end of the Christian church that is going back to things like race and gender, you know, with ethnocentrism and kinism on race and with, with you know, just the, the big kerfuffle in the SBC over, hey, are those women preaching God's word? We got we to gotta shut that down right now. So, you know, not everything that we're, we try to conserve as conservatives is good. Not everything that we progress towards as progressives is bad. Um, and there's no, in, the, in this data, there's no, you know, and, and the, this is the good or bad rating on each one of these things. You know, accepting LGBT folks more into the church isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, are, have, are you changing your theology without justification? Well, then that, well, let's stop there and take a look at that. But I'm just, I'm just wondering what... <laughs> the extreme right that's still saying exactly what Buchanan said in 1992. We have to take back our cities. We have to take back our culture. We have to take back our country. What on earth could they possibly be thinking they will do that would have more effect than it had in the 90s with bigger numbers behind it? Right. Oh, I think it's, I think it's political rhetoric that is opportunistic and it's it's fear-based and it's not they know there's nothing they can do there's no way this country is reversing gay marriage for example but they use that rhetoric because it frightens people into voting for them and it's a great way to amass political power um there has you know, to be a similar uh, yeah on the left similarly there's no way that the left is going to overturn the second amendment and round up 400 million guns in this country it's not going to happen mm -hmm. but they use some of that rhetoric to motivate their voters. And so it, it's all kind of just a kabuki theater, I think is what yeah. George Bush used to call it, right? It's just rhetoric that gets people excited and motivates voters, but it doesn't actually lead to any substantive change. Okay, Sky, I have this question on behalf of Christian Taylor. And so what am I supposed to do? Oh my gosh, I truthfully was about to stop you. I'm, I'm not even kidding. I was about to say, all right, you guys, this is all well and good. Uh -huh. But what am I supposed to take away from yes. this? Yes. You know, why does this matter to me? What, you know, what can right. I do going forward from this conversation to make a difference we're going, with this information? We're going into a presidential election year when everyone is going to be yelling all the time. Just everyone yeah. yelling all the time, just like they do on Twitter, but in real life, like everywhere, they're going to be yelling all the time. What am I supposed to do? J do I not yell? Do I smile? Do I, what do I do, Sky? Well, two things come to mind. One is, this is why we need faithful churches that are teaching the scriptures, not just... Not just AI pastors? The, right. But not... and. And rebuking the idea that the problems we're facing are primarily political and therefore have a political solution. They don't. The problems we're facing are deeper, they're cultural, and they're economic. And we have to have congregations and churches and church leaders who are bringing the scriptures to bear on the reality of the challenges we're facing. How do you form people into the gospel rather than form them into consumerism and into consumer Christianity, which is prevalent everywhere. Until you deal with that level of spiritual formation, the church is going to be an impotent and powerless force for change in our culture. But then secondly, on the political front, because as I said earlier, when we were talking about the Republican debate and the fact that we just have Biden and Trump again, our, pol our political system itself is broken. And 
if I were to mobilize people on an on a reform trajectory there, it would be we need to change our parties and we need to change our primary system because that's what's giving us these broken candidates. And that's a more practical thing. It, cha- it may yeah. be ranked choice voting. Um, we need a different probably getting away from the primary system and certainly from the electoral college. Some of those real structural changes that can happen would move us toward a healthier politics in this country and less of the culture warring. Okay, let's do all that stuff. How do you go about that? How do we do all that stuff? Uh, Can I say a thing? Yeah, 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 Christian. I mean, I think there are a lot of things we need to think about going going into this new political season. And the first one was a lot of the takeaways from the last time we were in this situation, which is engaging in these conversations, thinking that we're going to change somebody's mind and, and have them come over to our way of seeing things, you know, in some sort of heated debate is not effective. It's just not effective. And truthfully, what we need to continue to do is focus on our own spiritual development and those people that we have close relationships with that care about, you know, deeper issues, engaging in conversations with them, um, praying for this whole situation. You know, we should be in prayer all the time about what's happening in our country and what's happening with people that are kind of being brainwashed to see a certain thing. And I think we do need to be working on small local um, things where we can, our own little town governments, or even on a bigger level, trying to figure out how we can support what we do believe in. Instead of just sitting and talking about how we think this situation is terrible, there are things that we can actually do. We can help people register to vote. We can drive people to polling places. I mean, there are little tangible things we can do. So it would be doing something that we can do. Okay. Okay. If only, if only Mike Pence had had the nerve on January 6th to get rid of primaries and to change the voting system so it would be better. But he, he didn't use his hey. constitutional power to pass legislation. Everyone who's listening, Phil is being <laughs> facetious. You can't see his face. Ramaswamy that- said that he should have done that. Uh, a couple days, uh, oh. Sunday morning on the morning shows, said he uh, that know. Pence missed his chance to change the voting laws. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. But there are states who are changing voting mm-hmm. laws. Like Maine and Alaska have moved toward ranked choice voting, yep. and they're experimenting with that. And I think it's a smart, really what smart. What is ranked move. choice and voting? It means that when you go to vote, let's say there's five candidates for senator or governor, whatever it is, instead of just voting for one candidate, you vote for all of them and you rank them in your preference order. Hmm. So your top choice, second choice, third, fourth, fifth, all the way down. And then I don't want to get into the details here. There's good YouTube videos that explain it. What ends up happening is if your top candidate does not get over 50%, then you they re- remove that person and then your second candidate. And it's a way of... Um, getting more moderate people voted in rather than just extreme, you know. I mean, Trump got the nomination back in 2016 with a minority of Republican primary voters right. voting for him. Right, and He likely, and so he that's likely where we, wouldn't have won with ranked choice voting. Exactly. And even like those eight candidates that were on the stage the other night, you'd rank them one to eight, and it would probably be the third or fourth pick that would end up getting the nomination because... The others are too extreme, whatever. It's just a lot of European countries do this. A lot of other places do it. But our system, which is, you know, a duopoly between the Democrats and Republicans, they don't want to do that because it takes power away from them and opens up the possibility of non-Democrats or Republicans winning some of these elections. Yeah. Okay. Y'all, thanks for your support. Thanks for helping out. Thanks for subscribing to Holy Post Plus, which you can do at holypost.com. If you click on Holy Post Plus up there at the top and get access to all sorts of fun new stuff that we're making uh, all over the place. Christian's coming out with more Christian asks and Caitlin's coming out with more Caitlin schools and there's more stuff coming from Sky and me too. Okay, have a great week. Don't worry about all the political stuff. I'm sure we can figure it out. And Jesus will take care of it in the end. Okay, see you guys next week. Bye. Bye, everybody. Today's episode of The Holy Post is sponsored by Magic Spoon. What's that? 
Let me explain. I got a box in the mail from a new company that wanted to sponsor the podcast. I opened it up and it was full of breakfast cereal. I like breakfast cereal, but the box said this cereal had zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and four to five net grams of carbs. It's high protein, no sugar, keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, and soy free. And I thought, oh no, this is going to taste like packing peanuts. So I poured myself a small bowl of the peanut butter flavor and gave it a try. And the next thing I said was, Lisa, you got to come try this. And she said, wow, that's really good. But then our six-year-old granddaughter, Marley, came over, so we had her test it. She tried all four flavors that come in the variety pack, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. And then she wanted to eat more. She liked them so much, she asked if she could take the whole box back to her house. Seriously, magic spoon cereal, only 140 calories a serving, and it tastes really good. You got to check this out. So go to magicspoon.com slash Holy Post to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code Holy Post at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of high protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash Holy Post and use the code Holy Post to save $5 off. And thank you to Magic Spoon for surprising me and and for sponsoring this episode. This episode is sponsored by Fabric by Gerber Life. Remember all those life insurance ads on the radio when you were a kid? Uh, probably not, because that was for your parents to worry about. Well, guess what? Now you're the parent, and now's the time to get life insurance to help protect your family. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it quick and easy to get a high-quality policy so your family is covered. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes minutes with quality policies like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. You could go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash holy post. That's meetfabric.com slash holy post. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash holy post. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company. Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. Thanks to Fabric by Gerber Life for sponsoring this episode. This week marks the 60th anniversary of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Despite the significant progress made since the March on Washington, the toxin of white supremacy remains in America's veins. In fact, data shows it's actually gaining popularity. The shooting in Jacksonville this week, where a white supremacist killed three African Americans, illustrates how far we remain from MLK's promised land. Why is it so difficult for America to shed its legacy of white supremacy? My guest today says part of the reason is that we're not teaching the full history of our country and the real origin of white supremacy, which predates even slavery. He says it goes all the way back to 1493 and the so-called Doctrine of Discovery that made white Christians inherently superior to everyone else. Robert P. Jones' new book is called The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. Jones is the president and founder of PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute, and he's written a number of books about the intersection of Christianity, race, and American culture. And he's often featured in the national media like The Atlantic, Time, MSNBC, CNN, NPR, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. And I'm delighted to have him back on The Holy Post. Here's my conversation with Robert P. Jones. Robert Jones, welcome back to The Holy Post. Thanks. Glad to be here. Uh, the last time you were here, I was looking it up, was episode 475 back in 2021, where you talked about your book, White Too Long. And you're back with another book, also dealing with the intersection of race, faith, American culture. Um, this one is called The Hidden Roots of, of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. Um, like everything I've read from you, Robert, this is another like mind-blowing, deep dive, tons of interesting stuff here. And I can't get that far into this book, though, without going, I just have to put it down and rethink a bunch of stuff. We're mm. going to take most of this conversation just to deal with the introduction of your book, because it produces okay. and introduces stuff that 
I think is going to be mind blowing for a lot of our audience. Uh, let's start where you begin, which was with the New York Times um, Magazine's project, the, the 1619 project that came out in 2019. Um, talk about what that project was for those who may not be familiar with it mm -hmm. and why it sparked so much controversy. Yeah. Well, uh, just to kind of bring it back to memory, um, you know, it was a, a really groundbreaking project that was attempting to have um, people reframe their understanding of the beginning of the country. Um, so, you know, we all, I think most of us grow up and, and the, the year that seared into our mind is 1776, um, right? Um, that's, we had a bicentennial celebration in, 70, in 1976 geared to that date, for example. Uh, it's the most prominent date. And this, this project was reframing that to go back to 1619, um, so not the founding of, of, of uh, kind of the Declaration of Independence, but uh, to go back and uh, it was the uh, uh, the arrival in 1619 of um, uh, people who were Africans in bondage uh, to the U.S. in the British in the British colony. So if you take that as a starting point, I mean, the point of the project was if we take that as a starting point, what does our story um, look like how does how does that change who we are how, where we are today uh, if we if we reframe it uh, that way it, it was um, uh, uh, Nicole Hannah Jones uh, ended up uh, winning a Pulitzer Prize in, in commentary for her role in in, in that it was um, all over the uh, you know the New York Times was the one who first broke it it's resulted in a book um, all kinds of things I think the most important thing about it was having us rethink the importance of origin stories, right? Um, so if you think about, uh, you know, think about the Bible, right? Um, the, that in the beginning, right? Uh, in the, right at the beginning of Genesis, what does that do um, that that's where uh, the story starts? And, and I think that was the most powerful thing it did was have people rethink, a bunch, is, is the story about a bunch of white men in a room, um, you know, or is the story about um, uh, really op oppression and, and, and bondage and slavery? Uh, and, and so, so I, I begin there, but, but I, I, and it was great appreciation for the cultural work that that did. Um, I'm also pushing a little further back to say yes and, I think, to that, to that story. Yeah, so when, when the 1619 Project launched, there was a backlash from the political right saying that, that this is critical race theory applied to history and we're, we're reframing American history in a way that diminishes the role of, of the founders and these white landowning men and it's all seen through the prism of race. So there was obvious reaction that way. There was also some criticism that the 1619 Project, while focusing heavily on the role of uh, enslaved Africans played throughout American history, even before the founding, it gave almost no voice to the role of indigenous Americans. And obviously that's a huge part of the story as well. Um, you then go on to say that rather than 1619, if you really want to kind of mark a year as the beginning of the American story, you advocate for 1493. Now, most of us from our, you know, rhymes in elementary school remember 1492 as a really important year. Uh, why 1493 in your mind is really the one we should be focusing on? Right. Yeah. So 1492, the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? That we have those, those rhymes kind of ringing in our heads. Um, well, you know, it turns out that, that obviously that's an important uh, date. Um, uh, but 1493 is the year that Columbus goes back. Uh, to Spain um, and is actually commissioned um, with great fanfare and it's commissioned to return um, to the so-called New World uh, with a much bigger fleet, much more, uh, um, uh, you know, kind of bigger, more men, more animals, uh, more equipment, uh, the whole the whole nine yards to kind of continue this. But, but more importantly than that, um, this created a real problem, um, uh, a political problem and an opportunity. Uh, and, and what happened was, Spain needed to know uh, that it could rightfully claim uh, these lands. And so who do they turn to to secure that uh, claim? Uh, well, they turn to the church. Uh, and at that time, this is before the Protestant break uh, from the Catholics. So there's kind of one Western uh, uh, Catholic church. And they, so they appeal to the Pope in Rome. Uh, and there is this, uh, this these, uh, there had already been this kind of set of doctrines that were put in place 
uh, uh, beginning actually you know, earlier with some earlier ones. But the one that's the most relevant for um, the Americas is, is in 1493, where uh, the Pope basically divides the so-called New World between um, uh, uh, Portugal and Spain. Uh, and But the key here is that it is what counts as an undiscovered land is that there are no Christians living there, right? That's the key to it, right? If there's anyone who's not Christian and no other Christian country has claimed it, uh, then the quote-unquote discovering country has the rights uh, to it. And the, the language is, is fairly stark. I was going to read like from an earlier, one of the earlier documents um, uh, here, you know, that the language is uh, very plain. The right, they're giving rights to the political uh, kings to, to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens or Muslims and pagans whatsoever and other enemies of Christ wherever placed and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods whatsoever held and possessed by them. And here's the key line, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. So this is the official word of uh, the Western uh, Christian church to the political, to the Christian political leaders about really who does and doesn't deserve um, human rights. So the, the, the case here, and th these are a set of documents coming from the church, papal bulls and declarations ranging from 1452 up to 1493 that you're citing. Collectively, they're known as the doctrine of discovery. And to kind of reiterate what you just read and said, the argument is if no Christians occupy a land, then it's up for grabs by Christians. Western European white settlers can come in and claim that land and any property, wealth, uh, or people that live there or are found there become the property of the Europeans. And the justification for this is that Christianity and therefore Christian cultures are inherently superior to all the others, and any claims that those people and cultures may have don't register. It's only if Europeans are there that there's real ownership, and you can't infringe on land that other Europeans may possess, but everyone else is up for grabs. Yeah, that's right. And what they thought, you know, the, the clear assertion of what balances the scales here um, is that... Uh, yes, they're seizing their property, their persons, um, everything, the land. Um, and what they saw as the balancing factor is that they were giving them Christianity and quote unquote civilization. Like those two words show up over and over in these documents. And that was seen to be, um, you know, uh, from the European Christian point of view, uh, something that outweighed all of the things that they were that, that they were losing. In fact, they they were the argument was that they were actually benefiting uh, these these people by taking all of their stuff away, but by giving them uh, Christianity and civilization. Yeah, I, I want to jump ahead a little bit since you brought it up. There was a a U.S. Supreme Court case in 1823, Johnson versus McIntosh, where Chief Justice John Marshall is, is referencing this doctrine of discovery, which at this point is you know this is 400 years later, basically. Um, and it's, there's a land dispute between two white men over who owns a piece of property. One person had bought it, I think, from the government. The other person had acquired it from indigenous people. Um, and in the ruling, John Marshall says, The character and religion of the New World's inhabitants afforded an apology for considering them as a people over whom the superior genius of Europe might claim an ascendancy. Um, and then goes on to say that ample compensation was made to the inhabitants of, of the new by bestowing on them civilization and Christianity in exchange for unlimited independence. Basically, what he's saying is by giving Native Americans European civilization and Christianity, that was payment enough for their land. Therefore, by bringing them Christianity, we could then take possession of anything that they had because we would paid them more than enough by blessing them with our culture and religion. Wow. I mean, this is the title of your book. This is The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy, that white Christian Europeans are in inherently superior to all other peoples, and therefore anything they do is justifiable. It's really shocking when you when you take it seriously, as, as clearly these documents did, and really take it at face value. Um, it, it's an audacious 
claim, right? Um, and, and But it's one that fuels so many things that are actually much more familiar to us, even if we're not familiar with the doctrine of discovery. But we are familiar with terms like manifest destiny, our America as a new Zion, a new promised land, uh, you know, for European Christians, like those ideas that are much closer to us, um, uh, I think, uh, are deeply rooted um, in this tradition uh, and in this kind of religious and moral justification uh, for white Christians to come in uh, as settlers, uh, colonists, uh, and that lead to these horrific acts of slavery, genocide, uh, force removal, um, you know, and it's all justified by this key church doctrine. Yeah. And uh, when I think of the doctrine of discovery manifest destiny, what comes to mind immediately is the seizure of lands from native peoples in America. But this is the same doctrine that justified the enslavement of Africans, because as non-Christians, as non-Europeans, they were seen as inferior and therefore legitimate um, people to enslave and utilize. Now, this created a dilemma, though, because as the slave trade progressed and more Africans were brought to the New World and the colonies, some of them became Christians. Uh, Mm -hmm. This isn't in the opening part of your book here, but talk about what that dilemma then led to. Because once these people are claiming faith in Christ, you can't say, well, they're legitimate sources of slave labor because they're inferior, they're not Christians, they're not sisters and brothers in Christ. How did that dilemma create new forms of racism and new forms of justification of slavery? Yeah, and and new forms of law. I mean, this was the Mm -hmm. other challenge, because that's exactly right. If the logic is uh, that this can only apply to people who aren't Christian. Um, when there are conversions, you're right, there's this dilemma. And, you know, so you can see it uh, in 17th century, the development of 17th century law in Virginia, uh, for example, right? Um, huge number of enslaved people um, in, in Virginia. And um, there is, as there are these conversions, then Virginia law starts to uh, eliminate baptism. Uh, like explicitly in the law, that that is not a cause for emancipation. Uh, So that there could be then this perpetual chattel slavery, right? So if you're born a slave, your children are enslaved, um, et cetera, and there's there's really no exit doors, and and certainly baptism isn't one. But but they had to explicitly consider this, uh, you know, in the legislature, right, to kind of pass laws then to prevent uh, people who became Christian then from automatically being uh, being emancipated, uh, given that this was the original logic of, of, of the doctrine of discovery. So, so race I'm, became, race trumped then. That, and so this is also right. where we get this real sense of what does it mean to be black, right? This invention of this category uh, was exactly needed because there needed to be another way of kind of who is in this category uh, of people who are perpetually enslaved. And it can't be based anymore just on religion, yeah. So the the demarcation between Christian and non-Christian had to change into a demarcation between white and non-white. Right. And yeah, it's a fascinating yeah. shift. And then okay. in you know, and the Christian Christian doctrine uh, also supported that black white demarcation, right? There were all these kind of then then you end up with the need for this kind of development of theology to justify that black and white uh, divide, right? So uh, the curse of Ham, uh, you know, argument that black people were descendants uh, uh, of, of Ham, right, who uh, wronged uh, his father Noah, like the kind of mark from sin, or, or the curse of Cain. Uh, there were all of these kind of theological um, gymnastics that took place to really rewrite um, Christian theology in order to kind of read into it this this black-white binary. Okay, so that's, that's exactly where I wanted to go next. Yeah. And I don't know if this is a even fair question to ask if there's an answer to it. But like like that case is a really clear one where the need for racial hierarchy led to theology to justify racial mm-hmm. hierarchy. But when you go back and you look at the doctrine of discovery in the 15th century, do you have any sense of what came first? Was there really a theologically objective argument for European colonization? Or was it more all right, we need, we have an economic interest in colonizing mm. these lands and taking over their resources and enslaving its inhabitants. And now we need a theological rationale for it. So let's work backwards and do it. Or like, which came first here? Is it the economic interest that then mm. leads to the theology? Or does the theolo- theology come first that then justifies the economic interest? 
Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, by sort of saying, I think we go back to 1493, I, I want to be sure I don't commit my own, uh, you know, sort of mistake of kind of pretending that that's the year everything crystallizes. And right. because what, what if you look further back, right, that this logic is already with us, uh, the Crusades, right, which were several centuries prior to mm-hmm. um, the development of Doctrine and Discovery, have a lot of the same uh, justification, right? So that we, why do um, Christian King go on conquest of the Holy Land? Well, it's to fight uh, Muslims, uh, right, in, in the Holy Land. But this idea that Christianity is superior uh, to all other religions and that uh, it's justifiable to use violence uh, and force in order to spread the faith be- has become very deeply embedded um, in European Christianity. And, you know, you could take it back to Constantine, uh, right, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, Christianity becomes a religion of the Roman Empire. So it is this merger, I think, of kind of a religion uh, and uh, political power um, that ha- has been grafted together, I think, in, in Western Christianity's history that provides the opportunity. Now, when there is this, uh, it's, it's important to remember, too, that, you know, this quote unquote, again, discovery by Europeans of these lands was a momentous event. Um, like there was an entire continent here that, that people had no idea existed. I think it's hard for us to even comprehend that, but uh, that's really important. And and it cre- and the fact that there were these people here um, created a theological challenge as well. Like what do we, how do we think about those people? Who are they? How, what's God's relationship to those people? What's Christianity's relationship to those people? So I think it was this merger of, you know, missionary zeal on the one hand, but absolutely political and economic opportunism um, that kind of blended together here. So one of the things you highlight in the beginning of your book is that this doctrine of discovery was somewhat new to you. It, it was not part of your history education as a, as a kid growing up. Um, and I have vague memories of it in some of my education. But as I started poking around after reading your book, I realized that this is a pretty familiar concept among Native Americans. They're very well versed in this because it was so deeply affected them. Uh, why is it largely ignored in white mm. education? Why don't we talk about this? Well, you know, I think the main reason we don't talk about it uh, is precisely because of its very troubling implications. Uh, really, it, uh, is is the, the first thing to say. You know, if if we don't buy, if we can't say out loud and mean it, that we truly believe that the superiority of Christianity and European civilization justified genocide and land theft. Like, if we can't say that out loud without blinking that we really believe that, um, then that presents us with some real moral dilemmas uh, for the country today. Like, so, so it raises the questions of, well, what do we owe um, indigenous people uh, today? What's our moral responsibility, our religious responsibility toward uh, people uh, that are, uh, and I say this our as, as someone who's, you know, of European descent and Christian, that our faith has been so violent toward, that our faith has been, um, has stolen from and justified the theft uh, and genocide. Uh, how do we deal with that? I think that's one of the main reasons we don't bring it up is because it presents such troubling questions uh, uh, for us today. Um, and you're right, you know, I, so I, you know, I've got a PhD in religion. Um, I, I did an MDiv uh, and lots of religious history classes, lots of American history classes, and it really escaped my radar screen until I, re- I started really digging back into it. And when I did, I realized, you know, that it just, and even in the kind of contemporary period, Native American scholars have been writing, documenting uh, this for at least 50 years. It really goes back further than that, but, but a good 50 years of solid um, documentation. Um, scholar uh, Vine Deloria Jr., for example, in 1972, wrote this heartbreaking appeal that he just called um, an open letter uh, to the European churches of North America um, uh, and uh, to the Christian churches of North America. Uh, And uh, in it, he spells all this out and just says, look, all I'm asking you is to face this history with us uh, and to figure out where we go from there. But first, we're going to have to honestly face uh, this history between between, uh, our two people. Yeah, and for those who uh, think, well, yeah, this is from the 15th, 16th century. Mm. It's it's a long time ago. I wasn't involved in that. It's it's 
something we can't fix. One of the things you do a good job of in this book is, is showing how this doctrine of discovery even infects our core organizing documents as a country. Uh, it's embedded in the Declaration of Independence. It's evidenced in the Constitution. King George III, one of the reasons the some of the, the white colonists in the colonies were so upset with him is he decreed that lands west of the Appalachian Mountains could no longer be subject to the doctrine of discovery, meaning the American colonists could not just go west and claim lands independently for themselves. And Thomas Jefferson writes in the Declaration of Independence that they're upset about this and they want mm -hmm. to continue to conquer these lands. And then, of course, in the Constitution, Article 1, I think Section 2, when it's talking about representation in Congress explicitly excludes the counting of Native Americans, I think it says savage Indians, perhaps, as, you know, they're not seen as people, they're not qualified, because they are sub-Christian, they're not part of, you know, the doctrine of discoveries, validation of European descent. So these things continue to infect our history. Talk about where you see this today. Mm. How has this doctrine, which goes back 500 plus years, how is it still causing harm in American society right now. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you, you know, getting, bringing it up to the present because I think that is the, you know, you hear about this, it sounds quaint, it sounds very ancient history. Um, but the real question, you know, I, I, I think today I've, I've often talked about, you know, the cultural divides we're experiencing in the country, um, you know, that have labels on them now, uh, like wokeness and critical race theory and things you, you brought up. But it's really an identity crisis mm -hmm. in many ways in the country. Like, who are we? As a country, who counts in the in the we, uh, you know, and we the people who counts uh, in the our when we use these kind of possessive plural uh, pronouns? Who are we? Who who is envisioned uh, in 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 that? And I think that's the fundamental question, you know. And the the question that I think has always been uh, in conflict since the the founding of the country. Uh, and again, as you said, you can see this conflict. It's it's written into our documents. The co the very conflict itself. You know, on the one hand, are we um, a, uh, a a pluralistic democracy where everyone, regardless of race or religion, stands on equal footing before the law, or are we a divinely ordained uh, a promised land for European Christians? Like those are two fundamentally different visions of the country. They're fundamentally incompatible uh, with with one another. You know, we can't be both. Uh, we're either a pluralistic democracy where Regardless of race and religion, you know, you you have everyone has equal standing, um, or we are this white Christian country, uh, and we hear that language all the time, even today, right? That's at the heart of our. Um, I, I mean, I've certainly been struck as somebody who's you know observed politics for decades now that that you know it really is less about uh, our our deepest conflicts are less about policies, right? Um, and, and they're much more about identity. Uh, and that really, and, and I think it's because the country is changing, demographically speaking. Um, so there is now, you know, we've talked about this before, but, you know, we are today um, no longer a majority white Christian country. And I think that that demographic fact, and th and that's only happened in the last 20 years. Uh, but I think that that shift in the country has opened up these new sets of questions um, for, okay, like, how can we talk about, honestly, about our history and, and the conflicts that we're having and, and how can we, you know, come to, um, and this is kind of the second part of the book, how do we get to something that we might even uh, plausibly think about as a, as a shared future together? Yeah, and this is a lot of our conversation the last time you were on was about the research you've done at PRRI that finds uh, the MAGA movement and the Christian nationalist movement, those things, a lot of it is rooted in a belief that well, America is supposed to be for white European Christians and the influx of other immigrants, of other religions, of other races is seen as very, very threatening because it's it's messing with that core identity. Mm -hmm. And the appeal of Make America Great Again is this appeal to go back to a time when it was uncontested that white Europeans had control of culture and government and everything else. Um, the rest of the book, I mean, we barely scratched the surface because the, everything we've talked about so far is just in the introductory chapters of the book. But you then break the book into three sections about three different stories, um, one about the Mississippi Delta and the story of Emmett Till. 
the second one about Duluth, Minnesota and lynchings that happened there. A lot of people don't think of Minnesota when the topic of lynchings mm. come up. Right. And then the third section about Tulsa, Oklahoma and the race massacre that happened there in 1923. And in each of those sections, you give the backstory of how the, the doctrine of discovery and the treatment of indigenous peoples ended up leading to you know, ongoing racism, the events surrounding those those attacks, whether it was Emmett Till or, or the race massacre or the lynchings, and then how those communities are all coming to terms with what happened and finding a way of commemorating and repairing that brokenness. We don't have time to get into all of it, but in the minutes we have left, let's mm. talk about the Emmett Till story, because mm. that one feels like in, in recent weeks, there there hasn't been closure, but there's been new developments that are really welcomed um share what what's happened there for and maybe briefly for those who aren't familiar with the emmett till story i hope they are but for those who aren't maybe recap that amazing story right um well uh, i'll start with emmett till um uh so you know story of emmett till is um uh, a 14 year old boy who um, went down uh, to Mississippi to visit his relatives, um, was abducted and murdered by, um, you know, a couple of racist, uh, two racist men who um, were very subsequently, very quickly um, acquitted uh, of the murder and then uh, confessed after they were acquitted. So they couldn't be tried again because they'd already been acquitted uh, of, of the murder. Um, uh, and, you know, for years, this wasn't talked about um, at, at all. And in fact, if you went back to Tallahatchie, Mississippi, I, I'm from Mississippi, uh, not from the Delta, but um, but from Mississippi. And uh, yeah, I can tell you, I went to public school in Mississippi and, you know, I wasn't taught about the story of Emmett Till. Like I, I vaguely knew the name and the story, uh, but didn't know a lot about it. Um, but the, uh, but start, and if, you, and if you'd gone even as late as 2000, um, to the Delta and had looked around. There was no markers, no no one telling the story there in Tallahatchie County. Um, but there's a group of people that got together um, and very deliberately formed this group of black and white um, uh, folks from the area to say we're going to tell the story uh, and we're going to have you know have a reckoning. And we and these were you know people who had been there for generations. So this is actually the kind of great grandchildren of enslaved people working together with the great grandchildren of the people who owned them. Uh, uh, own their ancestors. I'm here in in the in the state, so it's a fairly remarkable um, uh, story. And they begin to work together to tell the story. And over the last couple of decades, there's now uh, kind of markers. They're there. They have refurbished the courthouse where uh, the trial took place in Sumner, uh, Mississippi, uh, and have really publicized this story. And the 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 last breaking news is that just two weeks ago, I had the privilege of being actually. Um, uh, uh, here in uh, uh, D.C. at the Department of the Interior for uh, a reception following the announcement by the Biden administration that there's going to be a new national um, monument uh, that will be overseen by the National Park Service. Uh, that's going to be uh, the Emmett Till and maybe Till Mobley um, a National Monument. It's going to be actually two two locations. One is Tallahatchie County, Mississippi, with several sites related uh, to Emmett Till's death and trial. And then the other one is going to be in Chicago, where he was from, and where um, uh, Mamie Till Mobley lived and where the uh, funeral uh, was. And and that's a result of like two decades of work and groundwork and storytelling by this, um, you know, uh, interracial group of, of folks on the ground saying, you know, we're going to try to heal the community. We're going to try to tell the truth. Uh, and we're going to use that as a foundation to move forward together. Yeah. Uh, people may be aware that there were thousands and thousands and thousands of lynchings that happened throughout, especially the South, but around the country after the Civil War up through the, the 1960s. And sometimes people wonder, well, why is Emmett Till's story often singled out as significant? And part of it, he was killed in, in 1955. But the other part of the story is what happened afterwards. There was a funeral here in Chicago where he was from, and his mother, a woman of a remarkable strength and poise made the decision, the horrific decision to have an open casket right. and reveal to the world how brutal her son's murder had been, his completely disfigured face. And she did that because she wanted the country to see the evil of the racism that had killed her son. And the photographs of, of his corpse at the funeral 
you know, circulated around the country. And many people view that as a galvanizing moment that sparked a lot of the civil rights movement in the yep. mid 1950s. So it was the, the strength of that grieving mother to do that ho- horrible thing and reveal this brutalized body that was kind of a pivot point in American history in the civil rights yeah. movement. So no, that's right. There's this there heartbreaking were, line, right? That she said, let the people see. Right. Was her yeah. Line. And it was a yeah. way of kind of putting a mirror up to yeah. American racism and um, so while there were thousands and thousands of victims of lynchings and, and racial motivated murders around the country, this is one that um, made a real difference in the course of history. And st- last thing before we go, you know, we can't go back in time and take away the doctrine of discovery. We can't change all the, the horrors of our own history. But your book focuses a lot on what communities can do to bring that kind of healing and acknowledgement. As you studied these three communities and the efforts they're making, what are a few things that stand out to you that you think applies to the whole country in this moment when we are kind of struggling with identity and there is these convulsions and fights about are we going to be a pluralistic society or one dominated by by white nationalists? Uh, what are some practices that you've seen that you think work in moving us toward that better future? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing I'll say is that um, the thing I've been so convinced about is that people who look like me, um, you know, I grew up Southern Baptist in Mississippi, um, uh, have a lot at stake here. I think we often think that we don't have a lot at stake um, in these in these conversations. But, you know, if we care about the integrity of Christian faith, uh, if we care about how what we're passing on um, to our children and our and our grandchildren, we think about like what's the legacy we are going to hand down. You know, I, I can think of nothing more honorable than to be the generation that tries to separate these tendrils of white supremacy from our Christian faith. Um, uh, to me, like that is honorable uh, work, right? And it's going to be multiple generations. You know, we can only see what we can see. Um, we're responsible for that. Um, but, you know, I think about the testimony of people like James Baldwin and King. You know, King talked about white people being uh, sitting safely behind the anesthetizing power of their stained glass windows. Uh, James Baldwin uh, you know, uh, said that, you know, he and many African-Americans um, said that they, they, they often, when they weren't angry, they, they, they were also like, look with pity upon uh, white people who they call, who he said we saw as, being, uh, and these are his words, quote, the, the slightly mad victims of their own brainwashing, mm-hmm. uh, right? And that phrase really stayed with me. But, you know, the, and, and I think one thing's kind of propelling me forward and why I've written, you know, another book on this topic, you know, is just trying to wrestle it to the ground for my own sake, right? And for the sake of how I understand Christianity, um, where we should be, you know, every generation has a responsibility to take what we've received, sift it faithfully, uh, jettison the things that our forebears got wrong and hand down the things, right, that we see as right and true. Uh, and so I think that's the project um, that we're at. And it's a momentous one because I think um, uh, we don't often say it this way. I think it, it's sometimes jarring to the ear, but but I do think white supremacy has had such a hold uh, on, on Christianity. And by that, I, I mean these ideas we've been talking about that Christianity is superior to every other religion on earth, and European civilization is superior to everything on earth, and so superior, in fact, that our domination, uh, uh, by really any means, um, has been justified. And and you know that that's a faith that's that's ill, um, and and so I, I think and and has kind of lost its way a bit. And so I, I think it's part of a call uh, to kind of bring back some integrity. And but what I see happening on the ground um, is a is a healing, and it, it's not. I think you often hear like. Well, we don't want people to feel ashamed or feel uncomfortable, you know, um, like those kinds of things. But what I can tell you that I've seen in these communities that have done this is anything but that, um, even from the white participants. I think they have found strength. I think they found um, energy. Uh, they have found re- in many ways like no, like it's not too short to say redemption, uh, you know, from a faith that was like really bogged down with these old really ideas that were so far 
uh, from, you know, the teachings of Jesus. Um, it really is a pretty far road, uh, you know, from uh, submit them to perpetual slavery uh, from a blessed of the poor. Um, you know, it's a pretty long road. Um, so I think it's about that. And, and so I've seen, and, and it was the coming together, I think in every case, that's it. It was the coming together of people who were from different different races, different communities, and didn't have a lot of connections. But they began this road together. It was challenging. It was uncomfortable. But I, the thing I just kept hearing overall is, like, you know, this has made such a difference uh, for me, uh, my understanding, my own faith. And it has put them in community in a way um, that has um, allowed them to go forward together. Just one quick example in Duluth. You mentioned Duluth. Um, you know, this is a community that actually was one of the first communities well before the Black Lives Matter movement back in 2003 who um, were going to address this lynching that happened in the 1920s. And they built this plaza, a beautiful uh, plaza um, dedicated to the three men who were who were lynched and telling the story. Um, and they could not have anticipated it then. But when the Black Lives Matter movement um, you know, hit and there were all these protests, Duluth had a place for it to happen. Um, and so that plaza served as this kind of gathering point where not just African-Americans, but African-Americans and white people were accustomed to coming and came together. It was kind of a safe place to have these conversations. And, and the other kind of story here is that the police chief uh, in Duluth, um, it was his great aunt who was the one who accused these three black men of raping her. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was and, and so he knew that story and had been a part of kind of telling the truth about the story. And it affected um the way he saw the Black Lives Matter protest, the way he saw policing and, and the way it should go. And it was a much more sensitive way of policing and trying to keep people safe during uh, during these protests, but not over-policing it, not coming in. And I think understanding, you know, where the anger was coming from in a way that I think many police, certainly white police chiefs across the country just simply didn't have. But because of this other work, um, a lot of groundwork had been laid there that I think made a real difference. Well, Robert, um, I, I hope that as people listen to this conversation, it has inspired them to want to, as you say, untangle their faith from some of this history and to get to truth and jettison the lies. And your book is a, a great step in helping people do that. I, and I hope as people buy this book, read this book, they do it in community and ideally in community mm-hmm. with people from other backgrounds where they can dialogue about this stuff. Again, the book is called The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. Um, I'm grateful for the research and work you put into this that makes it accessible to the rest of us. It's incredibly illuminating, and I do hope it contributes to giving the next generation a, a more rooted faith in Christ rather than just rooted in European civilization and supremacy. It's what we need. So thank you again for the great work and for being back with us. Uh, Thank you. Lovely to be here, and thanks for the great conversation. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Mike Stralo. Editing by Area Code Audio. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by subscribing to Holy Post Plus at holypost.com slash plus. Also, be sure to leave a review on Apple Podcasts so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more.